Um, Deuteronomy 30, that's a, that's a great chapter of the Bible. Um, I want to keep our place there and we'll come back to it towards the end, but first I want to point out uh, Deuteronomy 30 and verse 11. For this commandment which I command thee this day, it is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. And the topic that I want to talk about this evening is the King James Bible. Why we use the King James Bible, why we recommend, why this church is King James only, why we recommend that everybody use uh, the King James Bible. And this may be a topic that a lot of us know about already, but it's something that uh, is good that we have refreshers on it, and it's good that we know information. A lot of times we'll go out soul winning, and there's a lot of different, uh, the Jehovah's Witness, they have their own special translation. There's a lot of different groups that have their own special translation, and people at the door, they will ask these questions. What Bible do you use? What Bible do you use? And so it's good that we have uh, answers to these questions and that we're reminded of them. Um, Again, this church is King James only. It's the only version that, that we use and we recommend. Um, the reason that we do this, there's multiple different reasons. Um, the main one that I want to kind of focus on tonight is doing a Bible study on the Bible. So what does the Bible say about itself? Anything that we do in this church, any doctrines that we believe, uh, the virgin birth, the resurrection of Christ, the blood atonement for our sins, easy, you know, just believing on the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation, that you can't lose your salvation. These doctrines all come from the Bible, and the Bible also teaches us which Bible we should use. Um, there are over 450 different English translations, full English translations, uh, according to Christianity.com. If you use partial uh, translations, maybe that have just translated a couple books or a New Testament or something like that, there's actually over 900 in the English language. So with all those different translations, why the King James Bible? Um, again, all the doctrines that we believe are based on what the Bible tells us, and the doctrine of which Bible to use is no different. The Bible, all these things that we believe by faith, the six-day creation, uh, the blood atonement, the virgin birth, all these doctrines, we believe because words in a book tell us these doctrines, and we believe them by faith, but they are... Uh, it is a reasonable faith. The Bible says in Isaiah 1.18, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. So the doctrine on which Bible we use is no different. So there's a couple things I want to talk about. The first I want to talk about is that the Bible claims to be inspired. So uh, if you would turn to 2 Timothy 3, 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16. Inspired means literally God breathed or from God, from the mouth of God. The Bible claims to be inspired. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Now we see in Hebrews chapter 1, I'll just read for you, it says, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. That's how he delivered his word in the past. To the previous generations, he spoke to the fathers, to the, their previous generations, through the prophets. He used holy men of God, spake and delivered the message, thus saith the Lord God, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, the minor prophets. That's how God spake in times past, at sundry times and in diverse manners. Verse 2 says, Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Who is his Son? John 1, chapter, verse 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 1 in verse 14 says, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So the inspired words of God, the Word of God, not, not, the, not the leather binding or the paper or the print, the ink in this book, but the words of this book, John 1 chapter 1 says, was God, is God in the beginning. It was there with God in the beginning. Um, turn to Second Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1. So the Bible tells us it is given by inspiration of God. Uh, oftentimes throughout the prophets or in the New Testament books, you'll see, um, you know, like the, prophet, the books of Moses, they were passed down orally and eventually written down. Moses wrote those, but some of the stories in Genesis and Exodus and the beginnings, obviously Moses wasn't alive for the early part of Genesis, so those were orally passed down until they were finally written down. Uh, Isaiah, for example, he's speaking, God, the Holy Spirit is speaking through him, and then somebody else is pinning it down. Same with Paul in the book of Romans, somebody else is physically writing it down. But the Bible tells us in 2 Peter 1, 
Uh, look down at verse 19, kind of the nuts and bolts of how this happened. It says, we, also, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, verse 20, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. A lot of times you'll hear people say, well, the Bible was written by man. Can you really trust it? And with 450 different English translations, they can't all say the same thing. They have to say something different. And so this is a tool of Satan to get people to doubt the Bible, right? And so you, we often will hear people say that when we're out soul winning. Well, I think the Bible was made by man, written by man. Second Peter uh, 1 and verse 21, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. It came not by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. This is how we have the Bible that we have today. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. This is the inspiration of Scripture. Um, the most Christian denominations, most of Christian uh, churches or people don't disagree on this point. They all believe that the original Bible or the original books or parchments that were written down, the original manuscripts, they believe that those were uh, inspired. The Bible also tells us that uh, the words of the Lord are pure words, are perfect, are truth. Uh, if you would turn to Psalm chapter 12. Psalm chapter 12. I'll read for you in John 14, verse 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Remember John 1, he says, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Talking about Jesus Christ himself. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. John 17, 17 says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. The Bible claims that it is true, but not just true. It claims that it is absolutely true. Every single thing in the Bible, in the, in the original or in the inspired Bible that we were given, is 100% true. And this is what the Bible is claiming, that it is inspired and that it is, it is perfect, absolute truth. Remember, 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. It is useful, it is profitable in our lives that we know it, that we can study it. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. So if you look down at Psalm chapter 12, this is another verse that highlights the purity or the uh, perfect nature of God's word. Psalm chapter 12 and verse 6 says, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Notice the, notice the emphasis on the words. The words of the Lord are pure words. Pure meaning undefiled, no corruption, no errors, no mistakes, no contradictions. The words are pure words. And it doesn't say the punctuation. It doesn't say the spelling. It says the words, right? Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. It was the spoken word of God. It was the words of the Lord that are pure words. The next thing I want to talk about is, is uh, you know, God went through the trouble of over 40 different authors. We say trouble. That's kind of not really what it was. But he, we, he went through the, the process over 40 different authors to over about 1,500 years to give us from Genesis to Revelation, the book that we have in our hands, and he takes very uh, high regard for anybody that would mess with this word. Revelation chapter 22, if you would turn there, please, right at the end of your Bible. The words of the Lord are pure words, the Bible says in Psalm chapter 12. And God doesn't want people messing with those words. Revelation 22 and verse 18, right before the ending of the Bible, it says, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life, out, out of the holy city, from the things which are written in this book. God takes it very seriously if anyone were to add or to take away or change his pure words. Uh, these are, this is one of the sins that is listed in the category of Romans chapter 1 and the reprobate, where we get the, uh, the, the, the reprobate doctrine from. Romans 1.25 says, Who changed the truth of God into a lie? The truth of God, again, thy word is truth, the Bible says. They changed what the Bible says. They, they changed it into a lie. Um, another point I want to make is that the Bible promises that it will never be lost. Um, turn to Matthew chapter 24. The Bible says in Psalm 119 and 89, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. So we know in heaven, 
And again, John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. The Bible, the words of the Bible that we hold are the everlasting. They, aren't, they weren't just, oh, all of a sudden in the 1500s we finally got it. They are eternal words. It's, they were with God in the beginning, those words. We have it written down and we have it compiled around this time, but it was, the words have always existed. And they will always exist. If you're there in Matthew 24, look down at verse 35. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. God promises, the Bible promises, that, his, that the words, the Bible itself, will never pass away. We will never, be lo we will never lose the Bible or we will never not be able to find it. And this brings me to the next point. So the Bible tells us that it is inspired. It was perfect. It's uh, inspired by God. God breathed through holy men of God that spake. And, and these words were written down, and that's how we have the Bible that we have today. That's how, excuse me, that's how the, the original documents were. The next doc uh, doctrine I want to talk about is the preservation of Scripture. And this is where um, a lot of people and a lot of different churches and a lot of, uh, uh, yeah, churches kind of lose uh, lose track with the Bible. Um, they don't think that it's, they don't think that it actually promises to per, that God will preserve the Bible. Um, God, if you would turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. The Bible tells us that it will be preserved. It will never be lost. It will never be corrupted. And God actually shows us the way in which he will preserve his word. He kind of gives us the pattern after which we can expect to find it. Um, the New Testament books that we have, they were uh, written down. The, in Jesus Christ in the Gospels, he prophesied the destruction of the temple. He said, not one of these stones will be left standing upon another. And in 70 AD, that came to pass. But that wasn't recorded in the New Testament. So a lot of people will say, you know, that based on this evidence, the New Testament, the books that we have, were pinned down before 70 AD, 40, 50 AD, 60 AD, the books were pinned down. Um, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, in verse 17, this is Paul speaking, he says, For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. This is in the 50, 60, 70 AD range, somewhere in there before the temple was destroyed. At that time, Paul says, there are many which corrupt the word of God, and we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. So even back then, there was an attack on the word of God. Uh, turn to Genesis chapter 3. This has been Satan's plan from the beginning. The very first mention of Satan and the very first thing he says, there's kind of a principle in the Bible, the principle of first mention. When you see something brought about first, uh, it's interesting to note what it means. Uh, the, for example, the first uh, mention of alcohol in the Bible is, was when Noah, after the ark, he got drunk, and the story there is a pretty vile thing that happened. So the, the, the premise of first uh, mention in the Bible is an interesting thing, and this time we see the very first thing that Satan says. Genesis 3 and verse 1, it says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. The very first four words that Satan himself says is casting doubt on the word of God. Yea, hath God said. Is that, is that really what he said? Is that really what he meant? Uh, look down at verse 14. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, this is after the fall, after the sin, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and thus shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. He will put enmity between thy seed, Satan's seed, and her seed, the woman's seed. Um, Bible study on the seed, if you would turn to Galatians chapter 3, Luke 18, 8, Luke 8 and verse 11 is uh, the parable of the sower. The sower soweth the seed, and it shows here, it says, now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. So when it's talking about uh, Satan's uh, curse that he has put on her, enmity between thy seed and her seed, yes, thy seed is talking about, uh, you know, Satan and what he's after, and her seed is talking about the descendants, but it's also talking about Christ. Her seed is going to be Christ. This is the first prophesying, one of the first prophesyings of, of uh, Christ coming to bruise Satan's head. The seed is the word of God. It says in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 16, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. 
So this, this curse that Satan has on him, we see that Satan's lie, Satan's deception, yea, hath God said, Satan trying to attack God's word, God's word will never be defeated. God's word will crush what Satan has to say. Um, 1 Peter uh, 1, would you turn to 1 Peter chapter 1, please? Satan has always been trying to corrupt God's word. From the very beginning, that was his attack. He was got, causing people to doubt what God says, and that's what provoked the first sin. That was one of the things that provoked the first sin. Yea, hath God said. And he's still doing it today. He's, he's uh, persevering, or pers uh, persistent, I guess you could say. 1 Peter 1 and verse 23 being born again, he's talking about being saved, not of corruptible seed, not of corruptible seed, not of seed or, or a word of God that has errors in it or that has been changed or a lie that Satan has added to it, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which is the incorruptible seed? By the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. There's a difference between um, corrupt and maybe something that is not perfect. Uh, and I want to just highlight that briefly for a second. Satan's goal has always been to corrupt the Word of God, to cast doubt on the Word of God, to add to it, to take away from it, to change it. Um, and that has the malicious intent. Uh, if you would, turn back to Psalm chapter 12. Psalm chapter 12. So again, we see that the, word, the Bible claims to be inspired. The Bible tells us that it is absolute truth, the words that are contained in it. It is everlasting. And the Bible goes and tells us that um, there is corruptible seed and there is incorruptible seed. And the incorruptible seed will be preserved forever. There is a, pres a promise of the preservation of the Bible. Psalm chapter 12 and verse 6, we read this already. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, them referring to the words, the pure words, thou shalt keep them, O Lord, Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. This is written back in David's time. And they shall be preserved from this generation forever. Uh, if you would turn to Isaiah chapter 59. Isaiah chapter 59. The Bible tells us that God himself, God Almighty himself, is the one that is responsible for preserving his word. It's not up to us to dig up some manuscript and find it or decide what maybe an addition or an error would have been. It's not up to the knowledge of man. It's up to God himself to preserve his word. He promises to preserve his word. And we also see that there will be a generational passing down, a passing down, a passing down of God's word. It will be available from this generation forever, it says, right? It won't be hidden in a cave for 600 years, 900 years, 1,200 years. And then, oh, we found it. No, it will be passed down forever. That's the promise that God gives us. Isaiah 59 and verse 21 echoes this promise. It says, As for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord, my spirit that is upon thee, and my words which I have put in, my, in thy mouth, my words, shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed's seed, saith the Lord, from henceforth forever. So there's a passing down generationally to your descendants, to your grandkids, down and down the line. This is the... Uh, model that the Bible tells us that it will be preserved in. Um, so this is the preserved, the doctrine of the preservation of Scripture. Now, the original languages that it was written in, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew and Aramaic, a little bit of Aramaic. The New Testament was written in Greek. And so the King James Bible we have and all the English trans most of the English translations, they translate from the original languages. There are no original manuscripts. Those are long gone. Uh, we have copies and copies and copies of these manuscripts. Um, just to give kind of a little background on this and, and the, the texts that underlie what our King James is translated from, and one of the reasons why we're King James here, um, the manuscripts that back up the King James are what's known as the majority text or the Textus Receptus. There's, and some of these numbers, I don't want to uh, bog down with numbers, but I think it's important to know some of these numbers. There's 5,321 pieces of manuscripts in those original language that make up the majority text. 5,300 plus uh, manuscripts that make up the majority or the Textus Receptus. There are, and those manuscripts were assembled in the 13, 1400s, kind of when the Bible was being compiled and during the Dark Ages and everything else through church history. Um, those manuscripts followed that tradition. They were copies of copies of copies that were passed down and passed down and passed down. And some of the dates of those manuscripts, are, they range from maybe the 
900 AD range to about 12, 1300 range. So that's about the age or the time that they were written down. But they are copies of copies that have been passed down and available generationally since the time of Christ, since the time that the original New Testament was written down. Those 5,300 uh, pieces of manuscript all agree 100% with each other. They're all perfect in their agreement. Um, some of them are fragments. Some of them have a couple books of the Bible. Some of them are complete books of the Bible or complete New Testaments. Um, but they all agree 100% in the areas that they have duplicates of. The other family of manuscripts, which is what all the new translations are based on, the NIV, the ESV, the NASB, the New King James pulls from them, uh, Amplified Version, the Revised Standard Version, all the new versions of the Bible, they are based on what's called a critical text, which is only 45 pieces of manuscript. 40 of those are very small, a couple verses, a couple words at most. Four to five of those are something of size, you know, the decent size. They're still missing whole books of the Bible, many chapters in most of the books of the Bible. Uh, those 45 critical texts, if you took a percentage of it, so 5,300 plus majority texts, 45 critical texts, you have 99.2% of the text and you have 0.8% of the text. So it's a, the majority text, that's why it's called that. Um, but these, these 45 critical texts, they disagree with each other. They don't agree with each other and they don't agree with the majority text. They disagree with each other in over 3,000 places, the two largest, uh, the two, two of the main ones, the Sinaiticus and the Vaticanus. Um, but between the 45 and the 5300, there's over 18,000 differences on those two families of text. These 40 to 45 manuscripts, some of them are older than the, than the Textus Receptus or the Received Text or the uh, Majority Text, excuse me, the 5300 manuscripts. Some of them are older, but they do not follow that pattern of being passed down, passed down, passed down generationally. That the Bible tells us that's how God will preserve His Word. So these, these 45, they disagree with each other. Like I said, those, those two main ones disagree in over 3,000 places. Um, and these were all dug up recently. So that's why we see this explosion of new Bible versions. There was a couple, you know, uh, like the Joseph Smith translation, the Mormon Bible, a couple other things that happened in the early 1800s. But uh, most of the new Bible versions don't, you don't see coming onto the scenes until the, there was, I think the revised version came out in late 1800s, but most of them were 1920, 1930s on. This is when some of these new documents were being found that they've been lost to history for literally hundreds of years. So they say something, they read differently than what the King James was translated from on the New Testament. And again, I don't want to lose anybody on, on this, but it's, it's interesting to know, and I think it's good that we know uh, for when people do have questions about it, why do we use the King James? There are many mistakes in the new versions. There's contradictions in the new versions. Um, there's silly things that are just making the Bible out to be foolish, like was Saul one year old when he began to reign, or was he 30 years old, or was he 40 years old? Each version says something different. There are verses in the NIV that say that uh, if somebody rapes a woman, the victim has to marry the rapist. That's not, that's not what the King James Bible says. But the NIV does say that. There's things in, written in these new versions that make the Bible foolish and give people a foothold to attack it. And essentially, it's the work of Satan saying, yea, hath God said. It's causing people to doubt the Bible. It's, well, it was written by man. It has mistakes. But that's not the case. These new versions that follow this 45 pieces of manuscript, they follow the idea that um, God inspired the originals, but that God cannot preserve those originals through, through time. And that is not what the Bible says. The Bible says God will promise, God promises to preserve those from generation to generation. So was God's word lost for hundreds of years and then found and we still don't know? This is one of the arguments that the, the people that support these uh, new manuscripts or the, the new versions will say, well, if you look at like uh, Homer's The Odyssey, we have maybe 200 or 150 or so uh, of those. And we have a pretty, a pretty good idea that that's what he wrote down. Well, the Bible should be our authority in all matters of faith and practice. We don't want to have a pretty good idea that that's what God said. We want to know for sure that the words that we're reading, when we read a word out of the Bible, we want to know for sure that that's what God meant. That's what God tells us. The words of the Lord are pure words. It's an emphasis on the words. They are pure. And God promises to be able to preserve them for us. 
We don't have to worry about finding it, and, and a lot of the people that are supporting of this critical text are, well, you know, was this last part of Mark in there? Was this verse in? Uh, they take out key doctrines, too. That's one of the misunderstandings. They say, well, it doesn't affect any major doctrine. That's a huge lie. Turn to, um, turn to, um, well, actually, hold on. If you would turn to um, Psalm 91. Psalm 91. The twisting of Scripture and the, um, and the changing or corrupting of Scripture is a, is a key tool that Satan uses in his arsenal. And Psalm 91 is actually something that he quoted in the New Testament. Matthew chapter 4, I'll read for you. This is the account that Jesus was in the desert and he was tempted of the devil. And I want you to see what he quoted in Psalm 91 and see if there's anything missing. So Psalm 91 and verse 11 is what he quotes. Psalm 91 and verse 11. And I'll read for you out of Matthew chapter 4. There also gives an account of this in Luke. Uh, and it's the same thing. He misses out a key portion of it. And I want to highlight that. It says, the devil, in verse 5 of Matthew 4, you keep your eyes on Psalm 91, then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple and saith unto him, if thou be the son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, now here's the quote, Psalm 91, 11. I'll read what he says, and you keep your eyes on Psalm 91. He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. He missed a pretty key portion of that verse, did he not? Psalm 91.11 says, For he shall give his angels charge over thee. That's pretty close to what he said. To keep thee in all thy ways. That's the portion he left out. To keep thee in all thy ways. That was a very key portion. Satan himself is trying to tempt Jesus Christ, and he leaves out the part about keeping thee in all thy ways. Well, obviously, tempting Christ is not keeping him in all of God's ways and all of his ways. He left that out. So we need to be careful when we see version, versions of the Bible that leave things out. Obviously, we know, but for uh, other people that uh, uh, maybe have questions in our lives and we can explain them to them, and also for ourselves when we're quoting, you know, we want to be careful to make sure that we say accurately what the Bible says. We don't want to input our, our uh, translation. You see this oftentimes with people where they'll say, well, you know, if you actually go back to the Greek, the Greek actually says, and what they're doing is they're just dismissing what the Bible says here and putting in their own input onto what they think or what some dictionary tells them that they think it should mean. They're able to adjust or tweak the Word of God to fit their narrative. We should just take the words as they're presented in the King James Bible and trust every single word. They're pure words and the and Bible promises that God will preserve those words. Now in translation, God obviously uh, created all the languages back in the Tower of Babel, right? Uh, we see in Acts, the day of Pentecost, the miracle took place where all these men spoke in different languages. They were indwelled with the Holy Ghost, and, and they were able to speak in all these different languages that they didn't know. know. Why? So that the gospel could be preached, so that these people could get saved. Uh, we see even Jesus, when he was on the cross, there was a sign pasted above him, said, the King of the Jews, in different languages. Right? So God is the author of languages. God can translate, God can preserve, and God can inspire his original word. And he has done that today. So of those, of those 53 of the majority text, the King James is the only one that we have in print today that comes from those, those majority texts. The new versions, all the new versions, they come from the critical text, the different family of manuscripts. So this is kind of the, the history or the uh, uh, kind of the nuts and bolts of why the King James is different from the new versions. It's not that they're translating from the same Greek text. It's completely different texts. They disagree with each other in many different areas. So there also, there's tweaks and modifications and adjustments, right? Um, like on the NIV translating committee, there was an open sodomite on the NIV translating committee. When I was a kid growing up, that's the Bible that we used was the NIV. Um, and uh, reading through the Old Testament in the, in the King James, you hear often, you know, King Asa got the sodomites out of the land. Uh, they took down the houses of the sodomites that were near the temple. In the NIV, it would always say male shrine prostitute. And I had no idea what a male shrine prostitute was. But when you read the word sodomite, everybody knows what a sodomite is. And so it's, it's being clear, being specific. And we can see that, well, if somebody like that was on the translating committee, there's obviously an incentive to corrupt that word of God, to change that. And again, they're, they're translated from different Greek texts. So when somebody talks about going back to the Greek and, well, what does the Greek actually mean? We need to make sure which Greek they're talking about. They're not the same, they're not the same family of manuscripts. That's part of the problem. 
Um, if you would, and, and one, of the, one of the things that they talk about in the new versions is, well, they don't affect key doctrines. If you would, turn to uh, John chapter 3. John chapter 3, and we'll look at verse 36. 1 Peter 1.23, I'll read for you. It says, being born again, talking about getting saved, being born again, how are we saved? Not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. We are saved not through corrupted seed, not through verses that have been corrupted, Satan's lie. We cannot be saved through Satan's lie. We are saved through the incorruptible seed, the word of God. They say that these verses don't affect salvation. They don't affect key doctrines, but they affect salvation. John 3.36, King James Bible says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. You have believe on the Son with everlasting life. You have believe not the Son. Two different opposites. Believe, believe not. The ESV and the NASB, the RSV, the NLT, they all say the same thing here. They say, Whoso, whosoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Pretty close. Whosoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Is not believing the same thing as not obeying? No. Not obeying, that's a work. If you, if you obey the Son, that's a work that we do, right? Following Jesus, becoming a disciple of Jesus, applying the Bible to our lives, that's obeying what the Bible tells us. We should do that. That has zero part in salvation. This verse and these other modern ver versions say you either believe in the Son or you do not obey the Son. Those are not the same thing. It's, it's equating belief in the Son with obedience, and that's not the same thing. It corrupts salvation. John 3.16 well, Francis Chan, uh, he's, a, he's a popular uh, guy. He's kind of a new evangelical. He's a Calvinist. He's in the new Calvinist movement, uh, more on the liberal side of things. Um, I've heard him say, oh, John 3.16, people say you just have to believe. And he says, keep reading, keep reading. And he quotes John 3.36, you have to obey, too. That's him saying, that's his false prophet, his wicked agenda to, to corrupt the word of God and keep people from getting saved. He's a false prophet. John 3.16 in the King James Bible says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Only begotten Son. Talking about Jesus Christ. That whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. The NIV and the ESV, NASB, NLT, a lot of these all say the same thing. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son. Does God only have one Son? He has only one begotten Son. But if you're saved tonight, you're a child of God, you're a son of God, a daughter of God. The new versions, they change John 3.16 essentially into a lie because it's no longer God's only begotten son. God does not have just one son. I'm a son of God. If you're saved tonight, you're a child of God as well. So they really mess with key verses. They mess with key doctrines. John 3.16 has got to be the most famous verse in the Bible, right? Especially dealing with salvation. And is it any wonder that power has been removed from the churches that use these versions, right? Um, they don't have the authority anymore. They don't have the authority of the Word of God. They have the shifting sands of the different versions. Um, another interesting thing in the Old Testament, um, the Bible, the King James Bible, talks about God repenting in the Old Testament, right? Um, God repented that He made man on the earth in Jonah 3.10, and God repented. You know, He saw the works that they did that they turned from their evil ways, and he repented of the evil he was going to do unto them, and he did it not. God repents in the King James Bible, but all the new versions, they take away God repenting, and they just say God changed his mind. Well, repent, now you have this doctrine of repent of your sins for salvation that a lot of churches push, and there's no evidence to say in the new versions that God repents, so repent can't automatically mean turn from your sin. It's a way that they can slyly sneak in works-based salvation or slyly defend works-based salvation that they teach. Another one would be Acts 8 and verse 37. Uh, that's removed from all Bible versions. If you want to turn there, please, Acts 8 and verse 37. I'll turn there myself. So they affect doctrines that deal with salvation. They also affect key doctrines um, such as this one with baptism. Acts 8 and verse 37 is removed from all modern Bible versions, or most all of them. Uh, it says in verse 36, Philip has preached, or is, uh, met up with this Ethiopian eunuch and is talking to him about Jesus. And it says in verse 36, As they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here's water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? What is standing in the way? What's stopping me from being baptized? The new version strip, skips straight to verse 38. 
And it says, And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went, bound, they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized them. They skip verse 37. 37 says, And Philip said, If thou believest with all thy heart, thy may, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That is the condition in order for somebody to be biblically baptized. If you believe with all your heart, if you're saved, then you can get baptized. It's not part of salvation, but most of these new versions, they get rid of Acts 8.37 so that it's just, oh, we can baptize babies. It corrupts salvation. It corrupts other key doctrines. Um, it's important that we know that every single word of this book is pure, that we can trust every single word of this book. Uh, turn back to Genesis, uh, excuse me, Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30. So if somebody asks you about the Bible or you're talking to somebody about the Bible, obviously, again, we're King James only here. That's the only Bible that we recommend, uh, that we use. And uh, it's the only Bible we'll ever use soul winning. It's, it's got the power of the Holy God, uh, the power of God's Word, the perfect preserved Word of God. It has been preserved from generations through generations through that pattern that God outlines that it will be preserved through. And we can trust every single word of it. There are no errors in it. There are no mistakes. There are no contradictions. That alone is enough to tell us that, look, all these other ones have contradictions. That If you can't trust one point of it, how can you trust the rest of it? But the King James Bible has no contradictions. We can trust every single word as it is written in this book. Um, Deuteronomy chapter 30. Look down at verse 11. For this commandment which I command thee this day, it is not hidden from thee, neither it is far off. We don't have to go dig up the Bible. We don't have to go searching for what God said. We read the Bible and we can tell uh, the way in which God promised that he would preserve it for generations. It says, It is not in heaven that thou shouldest say, Who shall go up for us to heaven and bring it unto us, that we may hear it and do it? Neither is it beyond the sea that thou shouldest say, Who shall go over the sea for us and bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it but the word is very nigh unto thee in thy mouth and in thy heart that thou mayest do it the word is very nigh unto thee we have it here we have it in our hands we, we can read it we can learn from it we can do it as it says there that thou mayest do it it should be in our mouth it should be in our heart we can apply it to our lives we can trust when we read a certain passage we can trust what it says, that that is what God wanted us to have. Uh, you know, the Bible talks about um, Christian maturity, right? And it talks about um, when we first start out as babes in Christ, we, we need the milk of the word, the easy doctrines, the, the things that are easy to digest. But as we grow, we can handle the stronger things of the Bible, the meat, right? Um, we can trust that when we read verses like John 3.16 or like John 3.36 or like Romans 5.8 or John, uh, any of the verses that we use in soul winning. And it is interesting to note that a lot of the versions, most of the verses we use in soul winning, they are different in the other versions. Most of those verses have been attacked. But we can trust the milk of the word when it comes to salvation, when it comes to simpler doctrines. We can trust the milk of the King James Bible, but also when it comes to tougher doctrines, meatier doctrines, the meat of the word. You know, we get to the reprobate doctrine. That's another doctrine that has been altered or adjusted in the new versions. The word reprobate, words matter, right? The words of the Lord are pure words. The new versions take out the word reprobate. They use something like debased or defiled. That doesn't mean the same thing. It takes away from the power of what the, what the Bible is saying, what the Word of God is saying. You know, and, and uh, as we learn and as we grow as Christians, as we mature, uh, in the same way that, uh, you know, as kids, when they first start out, like our son, he, you know, just milk. That's all he could handle is just milk. And then he gets to the point where he's, he's eating purees and eating uh, soups and eating mush and, and making mush out of things. And then he's sucking on meat and he's chewing on meat and he's gnawing on it, you know. It's the same way as we grow as Christians. We start off with the easy doctrines of the word. We get into the meat and we, maybe we're reading through the Bible and we see something that maybe we don't quite understand. Just file it away. Keep going forward. Keep moving through the Bible. And the next time you come through it, the next time you come through it, you'll understand it more and you'll understand it more. And just as a kid, as they mature, they're able to handle stronger and stronger food, more nutritious food. We can do the same as we mature by reading the pure words of God. We can know for sure that every single word that we read, whether we can understand it or not, 
you know, depending on our, our level of Christian maturity. We can understand it or not, but we can trust that every single word is exactly what God has for us. We can base our life on the Bible. We can trust it for salvation. We can trust it for uh, raising our kids, for our marriages. We can trust it for every aspect of our life. It should be the final authority on all matters of faith and practice. And to anybody that maybe is not sure about the King James Bible or the King James Bible issue, I would ask this question, can you trust every single word of the Bible that you read? And if you cannot trust every single word of it, why are you reading it? You should read the one that you can trust every single word of. Um, it's important for all matters of faith and practice. It's what we're basing our lives on and living out in this Christian life, and, and we can trust every single word of this book. Uh, let's go ahead and bow in a uh, closing prayer.